welcome to all parents, family, friends, teachers, administrators, and class of 2014. I am so honored to be given a chance to speak at this ceremony tonight. It's even more special to me because I grew up in Manhattan and arrived here at Yarmouth High School as a freshman. In thinking about how I could convey how precious both Yarmouth and the class of 2014 are to me, I wanted to share a story of something that happened to me right before I moved here. Believe it or not, in the spring of eighth grade, I high-fived the Bishop of the Archdiocese of New York at my confirmation. <laughs> this man, with his regal robes and large hat, lowered his hand slowly to my forehead, clearly with the intention of performing the final blessing. I, however, took his gesture as an invitation for a congratulatory high five. <laughs> I had recently discovered that my family would be moving from the bustling metropolis of Manhattan to the large but sparsely populated state of Maine, where my father was raised. So, when the bishop lowered his hand towards my face, my eighth grade imagination convinced me that somehow, inexplicably, the bishop knew that I, Grace Mallet, was moving to Maine and he was sending me off in style. <laughs> As my hand passed his, the expression on his face signaled that a high five was not what he was expecting. <laughs> Uncomfortably, he dodged my hand and placed his palm right on my forehead and proceeded with the final blessings. This moment, besides being utterly embarrassing, also marked my realization that I had lost my sense of place in New York. As I went for the dreaded Air 5, I saw that just as there was no place for my hand against the bishops, there was no longer a place for me in the city. But as painful as it was to say goodbye to my favorite breakfast diner, childhood memories, best friends, and beloved doorman, Frank, I've come to realize that even though growing up in Manhattan shaped much of who I am today, the reality is I was never able to shake the feeling of being overwhelmed by life there. In Yarmouth, there's a deep feeling of support and unity that ties everyone together, from the youngest school children to the elderly. Cheering from the sidelines of sporting events and serving carnival food at the Clam Festival, people in Yarmouth feel a deep closeness and a sense of pride in even the smallest achievements. Teachers care so genuinely about the well-being of the school and its students in a way that has given me such a sense of comfort and bolstered my confidence when it has lagged. Regardless of where my life takes me, I know that this is a feeling I will always value. A month or so ago, I was asked to create a slideshow of the photos of my classmates that I had gathered for Spirit Week. As I went through this process, I realized that the class of 2014 has given me back that sense of place that I lost that day at the church. As a class, we are certainly a diverse bunch, from the playmakers, to the athletes, to the Eagle Scouts, to the goons, you guys know who you are, to the state champions, to the artistic geniuses, to the filmmakers, to everyone in between. But what unites us all is the support, the friendliness, the camaraderie, the positive outlook, and the enthusiasm that we share on a day-to-day -day basis, harsh winters notwithstanding. So, to the class of 2014, and everyone in the Yarmouth community who has made these past four years so incredible, this speech is my high five to you. As I welcome you all to this ceremony tonight, I want to thank you all for welcoming me into your community with such open arms and changing my life forever. Thank you. Just 
get old, you're gonna kick off before you even get halfway through. You realize the end of it's real. Slow down, you're doing fine. You can't be everything you want to be before your time. Although it's so romantic on the borderline. What you need, but you can see when you're wrong. Though you can't always see when you're right. You're right. You got your passion, you got your pride. Don't you know that only fools are satisfied? Dream out, but don't imagine they'll all come true. When will you realize the end of it's would make me happy forever. As I reflect on my 13 years here in Yarmouth, I realize I spent a lot of time worrying about how everything would turn out, whether it be a test or the product of my Easy Bake Oven. But looking back now, all the hype was for nothing, and I learned this important life lesson from a magnet. I was in Mrs. Jadlinzer's class, you see, and I was a little bitter the day we went next door to see Mr. Smith's Wizard of Oz play, because I had desperately wished that it was my class that got to do something so exciting. As I walked into Mr. Smith's classroom with my chattering classmates, I saw a magnet on his whiteboard that caught my attention. It said, everything is going to be okay in the end. If it's not okay, it's not the end. As a fifth grader, this quote felt like some type of reassurance that I too would have my moment to be Dorothy. However, throughout my career in Yarmouth, it has come to mean so much more. Everything is going to be okay in the end. If it's not okay, it's not the end. It seems silly now that I ever thought the end might be the final strike of a school playground game or the closing song to middle school dance. When I first read the quote on that cricket magnet in a fifth grade classroom, I was an oblivious 11 year old with no understanding of lives other than my own. All I knew was that I wanted to be the fastest biker on my street. While fifth grade was the first time I read a codified version of this lesson, we seniors have been living proof of this motto from a very young age. 
13 years ago, we came home from kindergarten one day to see a television displaying images of two fallen towers. Our parents sat dumbfounded on the couch and told us to look away. Everything would be okay. In more recent years, we have found out about trage tragedies ourselves through social media, during lunch, break, or even in class, and we have been the ones to step up and tell our peers, it will be okay. The question is, when is that end when everything will fall into place? Is it immediately when the action stops, or in many years when the wounds have healed, or we have forgotten that it was ever not okay? The end is not a destination, but rather a tick mark on a timeline of our lives that provides a turning point as we transition from one form of ourselves into another. You can race or you can crawl to an end point, but you'll get to that point and you'll cross that finish line or throw your cap up in the air and we will all be just fine. If your cap gets lost in the air, then maybe that's not your end. Maybe your end will be frantically running into the stands to find it. But either way, it'll work out. The class of 2014 is about to be released into a world of victories and turmoil. While I'm sure there will be many milestones to celebrate in the next four, 10, 50 years, I know that not everything will go our way. In addition to the academic tasks that many of us will continue to face, there will be global issues that we feel responsible to take on. We will begin to feel an obligation to care for other people. We will worry about our families, careers, and financial situations. And there may be days when we wake up and don't know what will happen in the 24 hours to come. And when you have one of those days of uncertainty, I hope someone is there to tell you, it's going to be okay in the end. If it's not okay, it's not the end. As I move away from my loving home of Yarmouth, I hope I can be reassured by what I read on that magnet eight years ago. I hope that reassurance will allow me to take leaps of faith and risks. And I hope my classmates, some of whom I've known for over 13 years and others I just met this year, will tuck my words away and take them to heart. I hope at our reunion one day, if you remember anything I say, it be reach high, jump far, and never fear the future because everything is going to be okay in the end. If it's not okay, it's not the end of your adventure.
Hello, everybody. <laughs> I'd first like to congratulate all of us for our success in completing high school. I would also like to wish everyone good luck with their future plans. Now, even though I am a senior, this isn't the first convocation or graduation I have and will attend. I have an older brother who graduated back in 2009. I don't really remember much of his convocation or graduation, except for a few things. First off, I remember the girls. <laughs> Here I am, a seventh grade. Look at these high school senior girls. <laughs> I couldn't find anything to say because they made me nervous. All I could do was flash a smile. <laughs> then I remember all the guys. <laughs> big and buff with beards and low voices that did not crack when they spoke. I'm like, oh. <laughs> They towered over me with their intimidating size, which for an abnormally large seventh grader didn't happen very often. The only other thing I remember from that ceremony besides the good-looking ladies and the threatening senior men is a speech given by the valedictorian. I don't remember much of the speech, not even the title, but I do remember one particular point the speaker made. It went something like this. We spend four years of our lives in high school. So, if we live to be 100, only 4% of our lives are devoted to high school. Now let's think about that for a second. Only 4%. Are you serious? That is a minuscule amount. In some science classes, 4% is considered an almost negligible amount of error. If your phone is at 4% battery, you panic. <laughs> 4% of a thousand word paper is only 40 words, which is Apparently enough for an introduction. At 4% of the download, we are complaining about how slow the internet is. If you read 4% of the book, you are normally not even through the first chapter. Anyways, to me, high school is the most memorable and has definitely been the best part of my life. It's hard to believe right now that only 4% of my life is devoted to these four years of high school. What did we do in high school? Well, we took tests and quizzes on material ranging from the derivative of x to why we spell effect with an a when it is a verb, which I still mess up to this date. <laughs> we dressed up in radical outfits during spear week and cheered for all of our friends as they passed the grapefruit or bent backwards while doing the limbo. We've debated our thoughts and ideas with each other during classes or in extracurricular activities. We have played instruments and sung next to each other in front of audience, audiences well exceeding our comfort levels. We have memorized foreign phrases and speaking lines for playmakers. We have won championships and worn our blue and white with pride as we marched out onto the field or cheered in the bleachers until our voices got hoarse. We have made an impact on our community and environment with our strong minds and loud voices. We have found true best friends who are glued to our sides and help us make it through some of the toughest days. We have had teachers who have inspired us to become grown-ups we are today. We have helped each other through the tough moments in our lives, as well as rejoiced during the happy ones. We have grown together to become what I consider a family. We were required to spend Monday through Friday together, but it wasn't a duty. It was a luxury, every day. We are a family who challenges each other, discusses with each other, supports each other, compliments each other, criticizes each other, looks out for each other, and, above all, loves each other. 
Now we are the supermodels. <laughs> and the big buff boys. <laughs> Despite the fact that my voice still cracks. <laughs> and now those seventh graders looking at us, and maybe one of them will someday remember what I'm saying in this speech tonight. Think, only 4% that seems like a very short amount of time for such a big part of our lives. Frankly, to me, the best moments have been when we were all together, because as a unit, we are unstoppable. I know that we must break up soon and branch off into new lives, going to college, careers, abroad, or elsewhere. We're being sent out to help create new unstoppable forces, but I know there'll be nothing like the time spent at high school. There will be nothing like our unstoppable force. I am so glad to have spent these four years with you guys. I am grateful to be part of all your lives and to have you be a part of mine. Thanks everyone for the best 4% I could have ever asked for. Good evening. As Michael Jordan, arguably the greatest basketball player in history, once said, I've missed more than 900 shots in my career. I've lost almost 300 games. 26 times I've been trusted to take the game-winning shot and failed. I've failed over and over and over again in my life. And that is why I succeed. Michael Jordan, not afraid to take risks, many of which never paid off, but that did not stop him from taking the next one. Having lived all around the world, I have discovered a common characteristic among those who are successful. They are never afraid to fail. As Reddit co-founder Alexis Ohanan said, go forth and suck. <laughs> many experts, entrepreneurs, are nothing more than risk takers when they start out. They often don't succeed the first time, but that's okay. It's okay to fail. For me, having to start over in new countries time and time again was tough. I often felt lost. I had to step out of my comfort zone and invest myself in something unknown, something new. I was afraid. But that was okay. Sometimes I failed. But that was okay. Putting myself out there is a risk. And it isn't easy. But hey, if life was easy, I'd be sitting on my couch right now watching Desperate Housewives. <laughs> All of you in the class of 2014 provided the biggest risk of my life so far. I moved from Australia to Yarmouth, Maine in 2010. I had to trade in my flip-flops for bean boots just so I wouldn't get hypothermia, but no worries, they're guaranteed for life. <laughs> it was new and scary and hard, but no place has made me feel at home like Yarmouth has. <coughs> and now I'm leaving and Again, I'm afraid, but that's okay. Many of us are leaving, and many of us are afraid, but we'll all be okay. Tonight, I'm honored to introduce a proud member of this community, Mr. Peter Anastas, an incredible man who has succeeded in his career by taking risks and learning from them. Mr. Anastas, father of our own Julia Anastas, is an owner and co-founder of the Main Course Hospitality Group, which owns, operates, and manages hotels in northern New England. 
He has served on numerous boards and his corporation have been, have been recognized by both locally and nationally for their business and charitable contributions. Mr. Nastas shares a long-standing connection to his town with development of several Yarmouth neighborhoods such as Oakwoods and Royal Point. He is a role model to many and a leader to all. If I can grow up to one day be half as successful and happy as Mr. Anastas, I know I have done something right. Please join me in welcoming our guest speaker, Mr. Peter Anastas. You know, before I get started, actually, uh, at dinner tonight, my daughter came in and said, um, daughter Julia, and said, uh, geez, Dad, someone came up to me in the hall and wondered how long your speech was going to be. <laughs> I said, we've got to get out of there. And I said, and I said, well, you know, most people would have made it shorter. I made it longer when I heard it. <laughs> uh, principal Hall, school committee, teachers, family, and members of the great class of 2014, when we were in school, we used to say the greatest class ever, and I never, never quite understood why, but um, you are a truly a great class. Um, and actually, I was thinking this morning, speaking of Oakwoods and uh, Royal Point and Applewoods, those sort of neighborhoods, that if I didn't build those neighborhoods, a bunch of you wouldn't be here. <laughs> Dick Woodbury would probably be the senator from Cape Elizabeth. <laughs> but uh, even then, though, 25 years ago, the Yarmouth schools made my job really easy selling houses, building houses, neighborhoods. Uh, people love to live here. It's a great town, it's a village, but it's the schools that really sold it. And, and I didn't really appreciate it until we put a daughter through school. It's, you know, maybe just allow me one second here if you could. Um, the principals, the teachers, the school committee, maybe just this one time, I don't know if they ever get recognized, but at this one time, just Stamp your feet, clap your hands, thank you. My daughter asked me one time, what, why are our schools so good? And I'm not being an educator, and actually, you'll hear I'm not even close. I, I don't know, but they are, they do just such a great job, and it's, it's just a great thing for our town and our community. Uh, I'm surprised and honored to be asked to do this. When Grace O'Donnell came over to the house, my wife said she was coming over. I didn't think a thing about it. I just grabbed a checkbook, checked the, <laughs> checked the freezer, <laughs> checked the freezer, can we fit, possibly fit in another tub of cookie dough? And that's what I thought we were doing. Anyway, it's a great, great, great honor. I met with uh, Mrs. Hutchinson, uh, Mrs. Houston, Ms. Houston, and the prin in Principal Hall, and they said, weave your story into something. And they told me one of the more memorable speeches where every, they, uh, I think it was Mr. Pierce, told the, the class that uh, when you leave, you won't have a blinking light in town anymore. And uh, in other words, your, your light will, it's, you'll have lights everywhere. It's gonna be big. Towns are gonna be big. And that reminded me when I was building those neighborhoods, Somebody I didn't even know walked up to me. There were no street lights in town when I first got here. So I built two or three hundred houses. Some guy walks up to me on the street, just looks me in the eye and says, you, you're the reason we have a street light. It just took off. I mean, it's like, it was, you know, it's crazy. I don't think I could change the town in such a little way. Anyway, I'm an unlikely speaker. Um, I wasn't the world's greatest stu student. I did discover, though, when I was meeting with Mr. Hall that he had gone to school, um, he was teaching school in Wayland with uh, one of my roommates at the time and classmates in the early, probably late 70s. So I hoped I could get a picture of Mr. Hall with long hair and, you know, kaleidoscope glasses or something, but I said, no, no, no. He was the same guy then and a great guy. But um, in any case, I was not the best student. My sister was valedictorian of a really large school when my mother would go to student teacher meetings, it would be Peter, his Kathy's brother, you know, it was one of those things all the time. But um, in fact, one of the favorite stories in our family is that uh, uh, somebody in another town was talking to their, uh, a child that wasn't doing so well, and they said, look, you know, all is not lost. 
I mean, look at Mr. Anastas. <laughs> He's had some measure of success, and he was a total loser. <laughs> In any case, it was, um, I ended up, did go to college, barely. Uh, I couldn't get in. I got a letter from a track coach out west, and I couldn't even get into that school. Uh, but I finally sent it away to this little school in Artesia, New Mexico, called the College of Artesia. It only existed for six years. When I hear my, uh, when I graduated, they had no more challenges, I think. But my daughter, when they were applying to schools, you'd say you have a 40% admission rate, a 15% admission rate. Artesia must have had 125%. <laughs> You're in, bring a friend, you know, it's, uh, <laughs> And then I worked in Wonder Bread in a factory for five years. There were no recruiters at the College of Artesia, trust me. Uh, and, uh, <laughs> they, in fact, they said some people didn't get into the College of Artesia. We all looked at each other and said, who could that possibly be? <laughs> I figured the parole board changed their mind or something. <laughs> Anyway, I worked at Wonder Bread for a number of years, and then I, then I painted houses for seven years after that. So, I'm, really, if you're in the bottom half of your class, the bottom eight, I'm your speaker. Uh, uh, I'd say if you were the last kid in the class, I'm your speaker, but if you blew off high school, you're probably blowing this off, too. <laughs> Life's lessons, though, are universal. I mean, it's your parents, everybody can tell you. So it's, it's, when you get out there, it doesn't matter where you finish in school. And as Ethan so rightly said, 4% of your life. I mean, 100, that's great. That means I got a ways to go. But um, hopefully, you know, you don't spend as many years in the dark as I did. I mean, I made some bad 60s choices. It was a bad generation. I asked Mr. Hall if we could talk about that, and he said no. <laughs> They've heard enough about that. So almost immediately, though, I decided on uh, a theme. Um, I, I said, oh, no, how do people get ahead, succeed, even when they are not the best student? And uh, strangely, I mean, I looked at it, I, I thought it was, you had to have a belief in yourself, an exceptionalism, sort of work like hell, in a way, or uh, a delayed gratification, and, and have a fear all the time. And so, literally, I'm watching TV a week after I alight on this general idea that's a show on CNN, Fareed Sicaria, and he has two authors on from Yale University, uh, Amy Chua, who wrote uh, The Tiger Mom book, and her husband, Jeb Rubenfeld, and they were writing a book called Triple Package, exact same things. I said, you know, I said, I'm going to be plagiarizing here, but it was my idea. <laughs> so, I looked at it more like it was destiny that I would have, was to talk about this. But it isn't really exceptionalism as, as, you know, everybody gets a trophy or you're exceptional. It's more that you believe that you can do something. It's just a belief in yourself. And, and then the fear, I mean, you're taught to have high self-esteem, and we always try to have everyone have a high self-esteem, but it's actually being a little insecure isn't the worst thing in the world. It really gets you going. In fact, they've even done studies on this, that people are with some sense of fear that they, they do better than they do if they just, they're going to be fine if, no matter if they fail or succeed. And then basically delay gratification. I mean, work hard and knowing that you're going to get your gratification later. And it's in a small business, believe me, that's the way it is. You keep doing everything and then hopefully it'll work out later. Their book was basically about different groups of people, ethnic groups, and, um, and how that they changed. 30 years ago, it would be different groups that are, have this triple package, as they called it. But immigrants sort of symbolize this whole sense of, we're going to go there, we're going to make it, we have this sense that we can do it. They're still afraid, and they get this chip on their shoulder because everybody looks down on them. And at the same time, they, they'll work as long as it takes, delay gratification to get there. This, they, they pointed out seven or eight groups, and like they said, they've been different 30 years ago. Nigerians right now represent 1% of the uh, black American population, and they're 25% of Harvard Business School students. Asian Americans start with exactly the same level as, as everyone else, poor or rich, and they usually have 140 points higher on their SAT scores. Indian Americans have twice the U.S. average income. Cuban Americans are 40% of the wealthiest uh, Hispanics, but only 5% of the Latino population. Mormons do exceedingly well. Um, and it's, in fact, when Julia, my daughter, went down to um, Washington to work last year, you know, I expected her to call up and say the government's 
interesting, the buildings are beautiful, uh, it's a big city, it's what, she calls up and says, Dad, I met eight Mormons. And I said, I said, really? She goes, they're the nicest people. I mean, and it's true, that's another thing, you know, when you get out of Yarmouth, you're gonna look and see people all over the world that are different. It's, it, we've often, you know, we've learned that we've made mistakes in the past, looking, not giving a fair shake to different races, different peoples, but consider it everywhere. I mean, I went out to the Southwest last year to look at possibly building hotels, and I met with a guy who was, um, Oh, a fundamentalist Christian, and he was uh, a self, just so different than me. And, so, and I'm not a very religious person. His sense of charity and his sense of work ethic was, was just so great. He had two people in his house, and I said, you know, is this your son? Your and there were two meth addicts that he brought into his house. So what I'm saying to you is, when you look at all these different types of people that we're talking about here, keep your mind open to anything. I mean, no matter who they are, that. Our prejudices change over time, and uh, we've, we've recognized some, but we haven't recognized them all. Um, to be exceptional, to think you're exceptional, it's almost always in your head. They, they've done tests with kids at Stanford, the best math students, and they'll tell them, if they tell them something that's a stereotype, like, we're giving this test to you kids to see why, and the Caucasian kids, to see why Asian kids, they say you're better at math. The, the kids will do worse at math. I mean, they'll, they'll do significantly worse. So it's always in your head is how it works out. They did a thing with um, uh, women playing chess online. If they were told they were playing another woman, they did better than a man if they believed in the stereotype and they would check who those people were. So basically, all those things, you, can, you don't have to, you just don't have to be a slave to them. And now that you can do anything. Um, so why? Did a high school loser like me think that I could even get any job after Wonder Bread? Um, it's a good question. So, my mother, it sounds stupid, my mother. My mother told me I could. She said, you're smarter than your sister. I mean, and I said, really? Oh, Let's get serious here. But my mother was a smart woman. She got a scholarship to Radcliffe, which became Har you know, the women's edition of, edition of Harvard. And um, I believed her. I mean, as dumb as it was, I mean, a little, you know, twerpy guy, um, Latin, you know, bottom eighth of his class, I said I can do something. So, that's, she had a work cut out for her, though, I mean, to show you how low my self-esteem was, I was not only a bad student, I wasn't a great Boy Scout, I was in the Boy Scouts very briefly. The kid across the street was an Eagle Scout, so we had to go on a, a camping trip, I said, Chucky Torrielli, that's the kid's name. I said, call him up. I said, I want to be, you know, camp with you, be a share of the tent, because I knew that he would do all the Nazi targeting up and all I, had, all I had to do was go to bed. <laughs> Worked perfect, like an absolute charm, until a half an hour after he went to bed. The head of the Minuteman Council shows up and has, wants to call muster where we stand up front. Now, this guy is an old wrinkled guy, looks like a cross between Geronimo and General Patton or something. <laughs> And we're supposed to stand forward, walk up, and do the three little finger salute and go, Sammy Jones, second class, Billy Smith, Star Scout. I've only been there a month. I mean, scouts don't lie. What am I? I haven't done anything yet. So I literally step forward. It's all dark, the campfire, Geronimo's looking at me. Peter and Estes, nothing. <laughs> I still get Christmas cards with Peter and Astas nothing on them. Uh, so my mother had a long way to go. Um, so the exceptionalism didn't come right away. I went to Wonder Bread first. Didn't, I really was just, I was sort of buying time, but I learned a lot there. I learned the dignity of work. I learned working with working people. Um, I mean, one of the stories, one of the things I remember most is it was a freight car. We used to have to unload freight cars and put this giant, uh, tube thing around the top of the freight car to suck the flour out. And it was zero degrees, and of course, I was <laughs> the youngest guy there, out you go. And so I have to get back, I got a wrench bigger than I am, and I, I just couldn't do it. And it was like zero, and I was freezing. So I came back in, and I remember telling uh, this guy, Paul Haggerty, I'm never gonna forget, you never forget these people, just like high school, you never forget these people three or four years you work with. And uh, I told him, I just can't, you know, can't, can't do it. And he, <laughs> Colorfully, in a colorful way, told me, no, you can do it. And you get, 
back out there. Uh, and so I stayed out there for about half an hour, an hour. I never, I never really got it. He came and helped me. But what I learned is sometimes it doesn't matter. You just have to do it. You've got to persevere. You've got to do it. And I learned a lot from that. I mean, we were young guys working in a factory, so we did fool around a little. We did as, I think I told one of my daughter's friends, we'd take notes and we'd slip them down in between the loaves of bread that would say, help, I'm being kept prisoner in one of them. <laughs> woman who would come through uh, on tours and she was a, a very pretty like I don't know what I had no idea 25 30 year old woman and she would dress in high heels was like you know walking amongst us factory workers was like this fairy godmother vision walking by and um, she'd have, to have little kids come by and they put their little hats on and hold hands come through it was the cutest thing but I said to her one I said Miss Wonder I don't know what I can quote her name really much I said Miss Wonder you know you never point me out I said I am unloading but the cupcakes with a surprise inside, the Twinkies, and I'm putting them on the racks, pushing them over the trucks. They don't get in the trucks, the little buggers here don't get their cupcakes. <laughs> Simple as that. So she, she goes, you know, you're right, I'll point you out. So I know she's coming, I and mean, obviously I got nothing better to do. So I find this chain that we used to use to, for a little pull truck that we'd uh, move pallets of flour around, and I wrap it all around my legs and around the machines. So the kids get there and I go, stay in school, I've been here since I was eight. <laughs> Uh, in any case, you have, you do what you gotta do to work in a bank, and it's, uh, I got fired. Uh, and actually, I, I, one more, one more Wonder Bread story. I'm sitting there looking out here at my friend Harry Rowan worked there with me at, at Wonder Bread. Harry calls up, uh, there was this, you only had like two or three uh, radio stations. We only just were getting FM. And uh, Harry calls up uh, Jerry Williams, which is a show that literally even kids would listen to because you didn't have any radio stations. And he made believe, he's I mean, somebody who became a social worker, he made believe he was uh, an immigrant, Spanish immigrant, and that his name Juan and his son Pepe was, uh, and we're, we're taping this, he tapes it, as we call as he calls in. And his son Pepe's eating lead paint, the landlord won't do anything about it. Well, so this goes on for. 15 minutes, and Jerry Williams is going crazy. It's one of his pet subjects. He's just going nuts on it. And it was a serious subject, but we had nothing else to do. <laughs> Finally, they say to Harry, what section of Boston do you live in? And Harry gets nervous, and he goes, Beacon Hill. <laughs> Jerry figured out quick, you know. I mean, there's all nothing but mansions on Beacon Hill. And so he, he really started to get on Harry. Then Harry, finally Harry just doesn't know what to say. And he says, you're just making fun of me because I can't speak English too well. And, uh, and so uh, Jerry Williams goes, no, no, he says, say something in Spanish. And Harry goes, I don't speak Spanish too well either. <laughs> That's the sort of thing we do at Wonder Pit. But it's, it, it's still, I learned a lot. You can stand out at any job. I, could stand, I didn't really stand out at Wonder Bread, but when I first learned that lesson, I was working at a tire store, changing tires. And I had nothing to do because it was slow. And I just took the whole garage and I just, I made everything perfect. I literally buffed up the wrench. I mean, just because I had nothing to do. And then I just, I'll never forget that day. I'm 17, 18 years old. The boss comes out. He just looks at everything, calls out his son, which was embarrassing because his son didn't have anything like this. He said, look at this, look at this. And from that moment on, I realized no matter what job you do, no matter what it is, big digit in a factory, you think you can stand out. And I realized it then. I guess what I really, though, what I learned about exceptionalism the first time is that it can work is when I started my house painting business. And I did this for seven years. I started in a room and house. My business card was the payphone in the hall. Uh, the, it was. It was a heck of a room house. I mean, they were, most of the people in it were, were put there at a, as a halfway house. Uh, but basically, I was just determined to make it. And I, and, uh, I pay a lady who lived there five dollars for every job she got, and you could not get between her and the phone. I'll tell you right now, she'd get. I got pretty big pretty quick because I was competing with you know, more painters like me. I mean, more guys uh, were last in their class. And uh, I got home one day, I had a call from Dr. Schaefer. I called him back and he says, you paid in my house today. And I'm thinking, I am so big, I don't even know who this guy is. And I said, uh, I said yes, sir. And, he, and I said, uh, he said, you paid in my house today? I said, yeah. And he goes, you weren't supposed to. <laughs> we, saw it. we painted the wrong house. So uh, it took me a while to get going.
done in that job too. <laughs> but what I did have, and then what I ended up reading, like in Steve Jobs' his, his, uh, autobiography, is the same thing that everybody almost has. You get like obsessed with, uh, with succeeding, except obsessed with, with winning or doing it. I'd be up at seven in the morning at the, uh, and, and to, to meet people to go to work, and then I'd be still making phone calls at nine o'clock at night. I used to get so, I wanted so perfect, I would, they would have a little, uh, say, exhaust stacks or waste stacks on top of a house, and I noticed they weren't the same colors as the roof. I would go up on the roof and paint them so that I could step back and say, it's perfect. Because, you know, they have drugs for this now for OCD, but they didn't at the time. <laughs> but when I read the Jobs autobiography, he did the same, he was just as crazy, because it's, you know, and I, I kept finding analogies to myself, to Steve Jobs, of all things, because he starts to have a computer, I start associated professional painters, but anyway, so be it. But uh, it's the same thing. You just have to believe and just never stop. And, you know, it's the same thing socially. I mean, it's, uh, you just have to believe you can fit in and make it. Second thing is fear and insecurity. Alex de Tocqueville was a French nobleman and came to this country in the 1830s or something like that and said, he was just struck by how he, he loved the country. He loved how people worked. He loved uh, their industriousness, what they got done. But he couldn't believe how insecure they were. They were always scared. They were always like working harder. He said, why can't they relax and be happy? And it's almost like, the, like we said before, the immigrant sort of thing where you feel looked down on or you got a chip on your shoulder because people, people don't give you the respect you deserve or you feel you deserve. And um, in this country, they, the upward mobility is supposedly not as good as it used to be, but when they test upward mobility, they don't test immigrants. Immigrants who come to this country now, to this day, succeed in wildly better proportions than the rest of us, because they're so hungry, they want it so bad, and they do so well. It may seem in, uh, <coughs> counterintuitive, but to be insecure is actually a good thing. When I was, and be a little afraid, I mean, when I was young, Boxing was a big sport. I mean, now, I mean, I'm, a, I'm scared of it. It's, uh, it's, you know, I've seen the punch drunk, drunk fighters, punch drunk, I mean, it's more than that, obviously. That's what they used to call it then. But the fighters that I used to like when I was young and now, you know, have trouble just talking. But when you would see them, my favorite ones were Muhammad Ali and um, Sugar Ray Leonard, which when I was a little older. But what I always, I remember my mother asked me, why do you watch this? Because everybody watched it. It was, everybody knew who the heavyweight champ was. Everybody knew who the middleweight champ was. But the reason I, I think I watched it is you could see it, it was that naked, right in your eyes. You could see the moment that somebody quit. You could see the fear. But Muhammad Ali and, I mean, maybe he fought uh, Sonny Liston. He was like an eight to one underdog. And, uh, and sure he had felt he was exceptional. Sure he had belief in himself, but you could see the fear in his eyes. I mean, he was like, and same thing with Sugar Ray Leonard. I would see it, I'd feel it. And it works. I mean, not that it works, it's, it just helps you. It gets the adrenaline going. I mean, I know in this last recession, I was sweating bullets and nothing makes you work harder. I mean, when you're in business. Because as a small business person, almost everything you have is on the line all the time. Um, United States, sort of, they say half the reason for the United States' success is that it's so, we had a chip on our shoulder. Europe looked down on us. In fact, Thomas Jefferson, sent a moose over to, literally sent a moose carcass over to Europe to show them how big that our animals are bigger than your animals. <laughs> That's a true story. Um, so it's okay to be afraid, and don't be afraid of criticism um, or make mistakes. As, as a young person, that's often what you are and, and often what happens. And it's, I mean, I know I've done some things recently that I've got a lot of criticism, but if you know you're doing the right thing, you just have to go forth and do it and, and you just let it fall where they may. Last thing is like impulse control, delayed gratification. Like uh, Mrs. Hutchinson, I, I liked quotes and I used to hang them up over my painting desk. And uh, one of them was like Thomas Edison said, 10% inspiration, um, and if success is 10% inspiration, 9% perspiration. And I truly believe that. Um, General Custer said, not how, many times, not how many times you knock down, it's how many times you get up. And that's a real big one. Um, the craziest one for the slacker in high school was, I used to love the quote, a day without work is a day without sunshine. I don't know how I got to that point, but I did. Um, it's, you know, it's, you have to work hard, and it's, uh, you have delayed gratification. I didn't have it, you can get it though. Um, you know, they, 
they have little kids where they, they put the marshmallows in front of them and if they'll tell them you can have one marshmallow an hour, two in 15 minutes. And the kids who take, most kids take one right away. But the kids who take two are usually more successful later in life. And I don't know how they figure, you know, they, they follow them through life. It's, but it's something you can still pick up later. Um, these, these lessons are like big, t in cap of business, small business. This is what I do. This is what, this is what so many people in the country do. It's brutally honest. You have to give a product that people like. You may think it's a great product. If they don't like it, it doesn't matter. Um, we get our money last. It's a, they say business person, sometimes it's, if you're successful, you, you think, oh, they just get money, for, you know, hardly do anything. No, you put all your money out. If I build a hotel, I'm buying, you know, the, I'm paying architects, engineers, builders, all sorts of consultants, the people who do it, and if it's successful, you get the money in the end, and then, then all that money goes into, it'll go to taxes and also go to doing it again. You, you go, you get a satisfaction on knowing that you're contributing to the economy. It's, it's that sort of uh, delayed gratification waiting for the reward. Um, and that's what makes business, oh, you have to compete, everybody, that's what makes you get better cars, better TVs, better, um, better products everywhere. Um, these companies, you always change too. I mean, the companies, you think that you can't break into a company, you can't be the best. The top 50 companies, uh, say 60 years ago, maybe 10 of them are still in the top 50. It's, they change all the time. You need to compete. But the real happiness, though, is not business is not your job. I mean, sometimes really what your job is, I think, is just to get, is get that monkey off your back. It's just, I can do something, I can succeed. I remember when I was coming out of high school, what in the world am I gonna do? But uh, it's just knowing that you can do something, the real, the real exception, I mean, the real joy in life is not necessarily the business or the, or the success or, the, or even money or anything. Charles Murray is a, sociologist at Harvard and he said if you have a good partner or family and you're passionate or satisfied with your job and you're part of your community everything else is a rounding error and it really truly is my job I'm not really passionate about it but I'm very satisfied today I was in Bangor Maine and I was meeting with one of my managers and it reminded me why how satisfied I was this was a girl at the time who started as a waitress in Auburn, Maine, with hardly any education. But we saw something in her. We made her an assistant manager at a restaurant. Then we made her a manager. Then we put her in, um, uh, at, down in Mystic, Connecticut, in, in charge of a, a, a restaurant. And then we put her in Bangor, Maine, and she became the, the best manager in our, our little chain. Now she has two uh, hotels she's running up there. It's, and that's, you do that over and over as a business person, and it becomes your your family, your, it's just, you know you're part of the community, and it's, it's just so, that's the, the satisfaction I get. I don't get the passion that say an artist might, but I definitely can get the satisfaction. Um, anyway, being well off or famous or something is nothing without your family. It's charity, community service. I get, you get way more out of what you put into the community. I mean, I spent far more time, I, like big brothers, big sisters, I went to a meeting and it collapsed, and they said 288 kids were on a waiting list. I remember I was so into it, or worried about it, I, I, I had to go to the bathroom, but I didn't want to leave the meeting because I, I, I ran enough and ran back because I wanted to help these kids. And we got that started again, and now it's, it's doing a great job. And it's been proven that if, if you work in charities, you do, you do so much better for yourself. I mean, the people I met in working in charities was just tremendous. Um, in any case, when I finished up, I was thinking of the movie Groundhog Day. And of all things, I mean, I, I read that same thing Charles Murray said, that um, Groundhog Day tells you some of the same truths that Aristotle does. And I thought this was a bit much, but, so I watched the movie again, and uh, it reminded me of myself. The guy's a jerk at first. I mean, a total jerk. He just doesn't care about anything, everything is, he's just selfish. And it reminds me, like my wife said, used to say to me, I wouldn't like you when you were young. That's just as well, because she would have been 10 at the time, but. Uh, <laughs> um, in any case, but what I realized, what I realized was, 
that um, and what he realizes in the movie finally takes music lessons um, he gets to really look at the people he's with and he works with and he gets to look at his community and he realizes that that is what's important that's the only thing and it really when we go to work it's so that we can have something like this I mean this is as good as it gets I mean that may scare you now but it's really you just can't imagine the feel I mean it was I had to wait till I was 45 years old for maybe some of those 60s mistakes or problems but to get the family I got and to live in this community and be part of it this community the state this country it was worth every minute of it so know that you can Go ahead and be successful, and you can succeed. Just be a little afraid, and you can do it, even if you're a total loser in high school. <laughs>
The challenging days of my existence may or may not be bright and promising. Stormy or sunny days, glorious or lonely nights, I maintain an attitude of gratitude. If I insist on being pessimistic, there is always tomorrow. Today, I am blessed.